Uh, thank you very much for coming. I think you're going to be uh, very impressed by the list of speakers that we have here today uh, talking about cannabis, cannabinoids, um, talking about all kinds of uh, exciting investment opportunities in the space. Um, and most of these folks, of course, are running companies that some of which are already multi-billion dollar companies in this space. So it's not quite ground floor. But nonetheless, there is a huge ramp to the upside from here, I believe. And I think that's why most of you guys are here. Um, I'm John Najarian. So I have been an investor for 38 years. I started uh, my career in Chicago playing football for the Bears. Um, that lasted a grand total of four games. Um, <laughs> so uh, I know about time decay. Um, and <laughs> That's one of the things that brought me into the options business then. Um, and a little guy named Mike Singletary is, by the way, the guy that my mom, my 90-year-old mom, uh, said kept me out of the Hall of Fame was Mike Singletary. Uh, because when he signed his contract, he was the Bears' number two draft choice that year. And uh, he held out because he looked around and saw that they had injuries at linebacker, and they had me. <laughs> and so he figured, I'll be able to get more money out of the Bears before I come to camp. Um, and I was a free agent, by the way, um, which is one of the reasons uh, that I picked Chicago. I actually, since I was a free agent, I got to pick uh, between four or five teams that were asking me if I would sign a contract with them. Because if you're not drafted, you literally are a free agent. And to fill out their roster, they brought me in. But anyway, that's in the past 38 years now, since uh, September of 1981, I started on the trading floor, um, traded down in the pits in Chicago, San Francisco, New York, um, and Philly. Uh, so I know a thing or two about uh, how trading floors work, how to manage risk, how to mitigate risk with options and things like that. I think it's going to be one of the exciting things that you need to do with cannabis um, and with some of the companies that are going to be presenting here because even though they are great companies um, there is a uh, obviously a feeding frenzy at times for this space not completely different from what was going on in digital assets or cryptocurrencies a couple years ago um, but cannabis has uh, multiple tracks that I think make it a better investment and I'll cover some of those in the presentation here one of them is medical of course and if you guys have ever seen somebody with Parkinson's um, taking some CBD drops under their tub, tongue sublingual uh, and see the reaction and how much it calms them down and all of a sudden somebody goes from having um, uncontrollable shaking and uh, tied up in knots to being able to sit there um, that's amazing same thing with folks with epilepsy and things like that. So uh, you can see why so many of us are excited about the space, but again, that's medical. There's going to be other scientific discoveries, of course, that are being made already in it, as well as, of course, recreational. And there's the biggest recreational facility on Earth is just down the street from here. Uh, Reef, I believe it is. I've been in it once. Um, and <laughs> just had just uh, doing some fact-finding. Yeah, that was all I was doing was fact-finding. Um, but, uh, and as you guys know though, the uh, cannabinoids and uh, CBD and all the rest of this, there is a, a huge segment of the population that wants to use that as recreational. Nothing wrong with that. It's legal in a lot of states. Um, and it's in fact one of the things I think that might push it to become legalized across the whole country and that is because of right to work and things like that, that there are going to be some pro athletes that are going to get clipped by this, that we've all seen an athlete here or there that gets banned for a game or a year or multiple years or even a lifetime because they're using a controlled substance. It's going to be a lot harder to do that, even though we all know that these are clubs or you know they're operating like a country club could. Uh, for instance, the Masters, where they can limit the memberships and things like that. Um, private clubs can do things like that. Major League Baseball, football, basketball, and so forth. Those are private clubs, if you will. Uh, and I don't mean the ownership of the club, but I mean 
basically they can set the rules, what players have to do to be able to play. But sooner or later, some player who's making a million dollars a week is going to be barred from playing because he tests positive um, for something that's legal in the state where he's ingesting it and so forth. And I think that's one of the things that's going to push this to the Supreme Court and hopefully speed through the uh, approval process. Because right now, as you guys know, since it's a controlled substance, a Schedule One controlled substance, banks can't bank it. Now, yes, there are credit unions that will do it. Um, so a lot of these big dispensaries get charged for putting their money in the bank. They feel like they're in Germany or in Switzerland where you get charged to put the money in the bank. Um, but at least they can put it somewhere because otherwise you have stacks of cash, you can't use credit cards and all the rest. So it's not a nightmare, it's probably a, a good problem to have that people are throwing money at you. But um, when you can't bank, that's a real problem. Um, and so one of the things that I'm already involved in is a, uh, what will be a $500 million credit fund where we lend to a lot of these dispensaries, growers, and things like that. Um, more and more, of course, they're doing vertical integration. The guys grow their own, uh, refine it, and uh, sell it in the dispensary. Many of the people that we'll be talking about today do exactly that. Um, but anyway, let me talk just for a sec about uh, beta. Beta, you know, whenever you hear us throw out these terms, whether it's on CNBC or to audiences like this, you know, you've got uh, things that uh, move with the stock market. And if it moves one to one with the stock market, we say it has a beta of one. So that's, for instance, if we're looking at the S&P 500, and when I manage money for people, that's what our benchmark is almost always, the S&P 500. So they're looking, okay, are you beating it? Or are you not beating it? And they look at the beta of how you're performing to that benchmark, one to one. Well, most cannabis stocks are somewhere between three and four to one, which is good and bad. It cuts both ways. So that's why on a day like today, when the market's down one and a half or two percent, depending on which section we're talking about, because I'm high, um, whichever section we're talking about, uh, you all of a sudden see the cannabis stocks, like the biggest one out there really, um, Canopy Growth, the one that uh, Constellation Brands put four or five billion dollars into canopy growth. Now that's a sixteen billion dollar stock, but it's down eight percent today. So it's down almost exactly what you'd expect. It's got a beta of about three and a half. So it's going to move about three and a half times what the market moves. So if the market's down two. It should be down six or seven percent. Um, you guys get how that works, but that's why this is such a challenging space because. When you're investing in it, you want those outside, you know, returns the hockey stick like this, but it also includes the hockey stick like that, because a beta of three means when the market's bad, this is really bad. But I'm not so much talking about what's bad, I'm going to talk about what's good, so let's dive into the presentation a little bit. Whole bunch of moving parts in cannabis. Like I've said, the, the issue here with cannabis is that um, there are banking issues. Uh, that these guys face. There are uh, regulatory issues and there's right now an arbitrage because virtually everything that I invest in in cannabis is north of the border. Even if it trades here now, um, it's a you know stock like Canopy Growth. That's a Canadian company. Virtually all these are Canadian companies and the U.S. is here, Canada's here, even though there are more cannabis uh, licenses just on the medical side in LA than there are in all of Canada people. I mean, you know, it's crazy um, how this has gone like this, but it has because Canada, they can make it legal across the whole country. Every province, they can make it legal. But in the United States, we haven't been able to do that yet, so you pick and choose. You've got medical and some, you know, more states, and you've got recreational popping up. and. Because of that, I think it's going to flip. Once, you, once we get it legalized cross country, you're going to see them go like this, which is why all the companies in Canada are trying to buy companies in the United States. Canopy Growth, I was with Bruce Linton uh, last week at the uh, SALT conference just across the street at Bellagio. And uh, that's a uh, Skybridge Alternative Asset Conference. And they had a cannabis track this year for the first time. Well, that particular um, uh, Bruce was talking uh, for Canopy Growth, he's the CEO, and he was saying that 
with the takeover that he's trying to do, he had to structure it in a completely different way because he can't outright buy it or his stock will be banned. Um, he has to basically buy a future on the company that he's buying, but all he's got, all of these folks want to buy access to the United States that are up in Canada because right now they have a, a bag full of money and the U.S., uh, it's not legal for them to do these multi-state operators and things like that for them to create the same kind of value. So that's why I say I think it's going to flip once we uh, see it become legal here in the United States. But with that said, um, so I've been, like I say, trading for 38 years. That's all fun. Um, most of the time, days like today, it's a little more challenging. Although I will say, um, before I left CNBC to come out here, I guess it was probably a, a Wednesday or Thursday, um, the first week or uh, the, the end of April. I remember uh, the guys on the panel were arguing with me about whether or not we were going to see a little bit more of a correction. And I said, they're buying a lot of puts that expire the third week in May. A lot of puts in every index. The S&P 500, Spider or SPY, um, the IWM, as well as the QQQ. So they're buying it across the board. It wasn't just tech. They're buying puts. And I remember Josh Brown, one of the guys I love to joust, joust with on the show, um, telling me, uh, did somebody put Xanax in my coffee or something? What's going on? You know, we're only 1% off the highs. Why is everybody going to get all excited about a 1% sell-off? And I said, based on what they're buying, it's not, they're not looking for a 1% sell-off. They're looking for 6 or 7% over the next two weeks. And I'm not saying that I'm clairvoyant. I'm saying I follow smart money. So when you guys hear me say that on television, that's not John saying John's opinion is this, I'm just reading not the tea leaves, I'm reading actual trades and then responding to that. Doesn't mean they're always right, and I'm certainly not always right, and I'll show you some of my losers here in the cannabis space too, uh, but um, I think it's a real important thing to keep in mind uh, that there are opportunities and that there are people that tip us off all the time where some of the best opportunities are. Um, sadly, these are two of the reasons why uh, this is a controlled substance and a Schedule One. Um, Hollywood uh, were willing fools for her getting this substance basically banned um, because the FBI, and this is not my conspiracy theory, but the FBI and various administrations starting in the 20s and so forth really pushed a narrative uh, that this was a really evil thing that it was bad and that it would cripple people and all the rest. You guys know Reefer Madness. And I didn't know about The Devil's Harvest, but I thought that was another catchy movie uh, um, marquee as well. But basically, um, tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, which is the active ingredient, the fun stuff, I guess, in the recreational cannabis, they really wanted to say how bad this was. Um, not CBDs, per se. Um, which don't have the flour and which don't um, have that THC, again, the ingredient that gets you high um, because of how it reacts in your brain. But they wanted to get this stuff banned. They did a great job doing that. Right now, cannabis in the United States is already a $28 billion business just in the United States. And think it's only um, a few states that you can really do it in effectively. Um, but uh, they already think that the hockey stick, you know, and whenever we say hockey stick, we mean all of a sudden the growth goes like that, like the tail of the hockey stick, um, is going to be huge. And I would argue that this is ultimately going to be this, a trillion dollar opportunity. Um, and the reason for that, there's a good friend of mine, he used to be a, uh, a fund manager with Jim Cramer, with Cramer and Berkowitz. Uh, when Jim was a hedge fund guy, Todd uh, Harrison was one of his head traders. And Todd wrote a very nice piece. If you Google Todd Harrison, I didn't want to put up his whole article, but if you Google Todd Harrison, H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N, um, and trillion dollar opportunity, you'll see why he lays out a very good case for why this is going to be. Because it's already globally a cash crop that's $300 billion. I said the US market is 24 so far, just getting started. But around the world, of course, they use it for cosmetics, for pet supplements, 
uh, for animal feed, for medicine, for clothing, for paper. You know, depending where you are in the world, that's why it's this big cash crop. And some of you probably know it was also used in nooses that they used to hang people with. Um, because it's pretty strong. If you've ever seen a, a big cannabis plant, some of them, you know, 12, 14 feet high, you start wrapping those things around and they can be pretty darn strong and that's why they were, in many cases, the rope that they used to hang people with. Um, and then you've got the recreational side of this. So like I say, I think this is all uh, uh, contributing to what, what is ultimately going to be a huge market here in the United States, but also globally. And if you've seen Tilray, T-L-R-Y, um, this was a company, I, it's not part of my slides, but Tilray was a company that when it came public, um, I was trying to get in on the IPO. I frequently try, I don't always get. Um, like Mick Jagger sings, you don't always get what you want. Um, even me, and I trade an awful lot. Uh, but uh, I didn't get into Tilray. Um, and it came public, I think, at either 17 or 19 a share. By the time I could buy it, it was $31 a share. Um, I held it for about two months, and my first batch I dumped out at about $110 a share. The next batch I dumped, as I was walking through CB CNBC in the morning, um, the desk was saying, John, you holding on? And I said, nope. I said, as soon as it goes through 200, because in the pre-market it jumped from 150 to 200. I said, I'm out, this is just stupid. Something's going on, somebody's getting squeezed. I don't know why, but somebody's driving this stock up. It hasn't got this kind of great news that would justify this. It went to 300 that day. And then came all the way back down to close at 210, and then broke 100, I think, a day or two days later. So those are what's known as short squeezes. There were a couple big funds that had sold it short, and everybody else started saying, well, we know these guys have to buy it back. So they made it very painful for them. And eventually these, I think both funds went broke being shorted. Um, this is, and by the way, Tilray, um, one of the things that was always exciting for them is they were delivering cannabis overseas. Um, so they cut a deal with Germany. They cut a deal with Denmark. They cut a deal with Great Britain. So all of a sudden there's this company that's growing and exporting cannabis around the world. That's one of the reasons people got excited about it. A company named Privateer out of Seattle was one of their big lead investors and made billions of dollars on that trade, but also, of course, couldn't get out because they were locked up, as they say, you know, you can't sell for the first 60 days and then you can only sell half or whatever. Anyway, because they were an insider. Um, but anyway, let me talk about this. This is... Um, uh, Florida has now 250,000 registered cannabis patients for their medical marijuana. There are several firms in Canada that have um, uh, licenses for the, I mean, they've got a ton of licenses in Florida, but most of them are owned by Trueleaf, Cureleaf, um, Sur Surterra, and uh, Liberty Health. But you can, and in fact, I had the good fortune of talking to Kim, who's the CEO of True Leave up at a cannabis conference recently, and they have done a fabulous job building out their brand throughout Florida and so forth. And the dispensaries obviously have a pretty significant edge, especially when they have vertical integration that I talked about. Um, here's right now my top holdings in cannabis, Cure Leaf. Um, it's up 137% before today. <laughs> it's probably down 8 or 10% today, um, but it's up 137%. Canopy growth, 75%. Harvest, 52%. Um, True Leave, like I say, that's Kim's company, um, up 50%. Astonishing numbers in basically a little over one quarter. That's how much they're up. Now, significant losers, however, too. MedMen has done nothing um, positive for the last uh, six or eight months. I'm still holding it, but I kind of, uh, and it's not like carving me up too bad, but I was at the SALT conference, I was with this performance coach because they had all these different people circulating around. So sort of like Wendy on Billions, if you guys watch that show. I was asking her, why is it, Wendy, that when I have a, her name's not Wendy, it's actually Samantha, but I said, Samantha, 
when I lose money, I feel worse than when I make money, I feel good. What is that about? And she said, well, John, that's natural. She said, that's because you know when we were animals in the jungle and so forth, you, if you lose, um, you're going to die. Um, you can't afford to lose. You've got to win. Um, so your mind and our minds are set to win. And uh, she said, but the fear of losing is what the bad side of it is. And I told her, I don't fear losing. I just don't like it. Um, because it, you know, we all know it happens to all of us. But I just have to, she said, instead focus, John, on what, um, what you learned from that loss, <laughs> which I love that advice But because I, I don't want to dwell on it too much. But I do want to dwell on these. Canopy growth. So that's Bruce. He is the CEO over there at Canopy Growth. As I said, they took in multi-billions from Constellation brands because Constellation, of course, has Corona uh, and a, a, a bunch of beer uh, that they do globally. And they, they thought, if this stuff does become legal, we want to be one of the guys putting it in cans and selling beverages with this stuff or whatever. Um, and Canopy has done fabulous. You can see a lot of what Bruce has here is, you know, a lot of those little, those little white things going into the plants. Those are, of course, watering and so forth for his crops. $16 billion company. Aurora Cannabis, they're here um, at this show. Aurora is an $8.3 billion medical cannabis play. And I'm not trying to emphasize too much on the, oh, these guys are medical, that makes them good. But uh, purity with product is a big deal. And most people will tell you that when you're going to a dispensary to get dosing, um, you want to make sure that what you're getting is what you think you, what, what you asked for, really. You don't want to go in and have somebody give you Kush, you know, or, uh, you know, Wiz Khalifa's Kush, uh, which is 27% THC, when you're expecting something that's a much lower dose, and instead you get Wiz Khalifa's kind of level of uh, high, and you can't function for two days. Um, because if you've seen some of the folks that do 27% stuff, they're, they're either Willie Nelson um, or, you know, they're somebody who uh, uh, can barely function. Um, GW Pharma, so these guys, as the name sort of implies, they're looking at all kinds of different ways to make um, cannabis and CBD uh, basically curing everything from cancer to helping patients with Parkinson's and so forth. This was one of the first plays um, that people had an access to in the cannabis space. GW Pharma, $5 billion company. Acreage, um, this is the one I think that uh, um, uh, Bruce was buying uh, or getting an option on, if you will, buying a future, uh, however he was operating it. They have uh, operations across the U.S. and they're about a $2.3 billion play. Afria, almost $2 billion. Um, medical cannabis powered by sunlight. Some of these, like one of them coming up in a couple slides, uh, sort of like Bitcoin folks, there's uh, the power usage if you're not in a place where you can uh, ha grow outdoors. Most of these are indoor grow houses. And I think Bruce's uh, up in Canada is 1.6 million square feet or something like that. I mean, it just goes forever. It's like in Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're hiding the ark at the end of the movie and the guy's just pushing that cart along that path. That's what they're like, except obviously with much lower ceilings. But these are huge grow houses, which means in many cases that they have a lot of money to spend to get the uh, plants to grow correctly. And so Afria, powered by sunlight. This one, OGI or Oregon, uh, that is also uh, just a crazy, um, wonderful metal, medical marijuana company. Cresco Labs, 1.3 billion, they just did a deal um, with uh, another company that has certain brands like Cheech and Chong's sort of brand, Cheech's Stash or Chong's Choice and things like that. There are certain, and in the United States, you can brand like that. By the way, you can't use a name in Canada for, you can't have a more or less celebrity endorsement. 
when I was talking with Dan Bilzerian, um, who's got a cannabis company, whenever he's not being a playboy and uh, hanging out with all these girls, um, he's actually uh, the head of Ignite. Um, and Ignite should be a billion dollar cannabis play as well if they get their paperwork right. Um, they brought in a guy from British American Tobacco, um, which uh, his name is Jim McCormick, to try to you know get this to be an adult operation, because they uh, uh, there's a temptation when you've got a brand like Dan to uh, pr probably go over the edge, um, and Dan loves cannabis. He says you know uh, uh, you know do you want indica or sativa? Sativa is what I take before I work out. Indica is what I take when I want to go to sleep and so forth. So um, there are these different strains, as you guys know, uh, that basically will become billion dollar brands and some of them will be sold in places like this, um, which is uh, MedMen. Um, and a MedMen store will feel a lot more, to those of you who haven't seen one, it'll feel a lot more like an Apple store. You walk in there and there's iPads all over the tables and you know it's nice wood and stainless steel and things like that. The folks are in you know those red shirts with the med men on them and so forth. It'll it'll feel very similar to an Apple store. That's the feel a lot of these dispensaries are trying to get. Um, and uh, yet another reason you know beyond the recreational when people go in and want uh, because in New York it's not um, legal for recreational yet, but the medical. Uh, side of it is legal in New York and they're selling now and MedMen's more or less a California play but they had to buy a store on Fifth Avenue to basically you know put the flag in and say we're gonna run from here as well so those are some of the stocks that when I'm looking at uh, here's can trust uh, let's see let me I'm just gonna because I'm running out of time I'm just gonna show you a couple others um, Antheus Capital um, this one is uh, village farms these guys grow tomatoes okay and they figured out with their grow houses and things like that they don't just grow tomatoes whole bunch of crops but then they figured well we'll get a license and we'll grow cannabis we'll hire a couple of these folks and we'll grow cannabis which obviously is a lot more profitable than tomatoes um, and they use landfill gas to uh, both heat um, the greenhouses and also, some of the uh, CO2, the plants love CO2. So they're sitting there, you know, consuming the CO2, as you guys know how plants work. Um, they belch out oxygen and they take in CO2. So these plants grow, I think, 30% faster because of the way these guys are addressing that. So when I started the presentation and I said there's a lot of moving parts, um, as you guys know, some of the plays in America have been like, photonics um, or believe it or not miracle grow Scott's miracle grow was one of the first things people like my brother Pete were buying as far as the cannabis play because they knew they needed to have you know the fertilizer to get the plants big because and when you see really big plants and things like that like I've said you'll see plants that are 12 14 feet high before you get to the top with the flowers and things like that just amazing um, and there are a lot, there's one of these places, Honeydew Farms is going to be like the Screaming Eagle of pot. Um, if those of you who've had Screaming or know what Screaming Eagle is, it's a very high-end wine that at a steakhouse in Vegas will probably cost you between $3,500 and $5,000 a bottle. Why? It's just Cabernet, right? Um, but because it's got that cult status, the same sort of thing's going on right now with... Um, things like uh, Honeydew Farms. And I'd encourage you to take a look at that. It's not a publicly traded thing yet, but Honeydew Farms, they have hundreds of acres up in Humboldt, California. Um, and uh, this is uh, when you see those plants and you, you can practically smell the resin just by looking at those pictures. I should have put one in my slides, so I screwed up. Um, but let me answer some questions because I've used up my time and right at 9.30, I wanted to answer questions. I'll take you first, sir. Please. Dr. Jay, I just want to know what you think the saturation point is. Because it seems to be everyone in Canada is going to license, everyone's growing. What, what do you see as a saturation point? Sure. 
you guys heard the question, what's the saturation point? I'm just repeating it, sir, for the camera that they're taping for people watching at home. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near the saturation point yet. It will come. I mean, like in the Congo, they're growing cannabis right now. Um, and they can grow it at 70 or 80 percent less than we can. 90 percent? Um, Thank you. 90 percent less. Well, see, there's a gentleman that knows. Um, oh, yes. I mean, fertile ground, lots of sun, you know, there's lots of reasons why. And by the way, in Canada, they can't keep up. The, Canada did sort of like Utah as far as all of the dispensaries in Canada are run by the government. So like in Utah, when you go into a liquor store, those of you who've skied or enjoyed Utah, you buy your liquor. They do have grocery stores that sell certain types of beer and things like that. But all of the dispensaries that sell um, liquor are state run in Utah. And the same thing's true in Canada. And they've exhausted all of the cannabis. They can't get enough cannabis in those places. Um, so the saturation point's not there yet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is that unique? Well, I, I think, and I might be wrong, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right. I think there are a thousand legal dispensaries in California. You saw the numbers when I put up on the screen here of how many there are in Florida. <clears throat> but so California has just a, here's, I mean, those are dispensaries. The biggest one is run by True Leaf and then Cura Leaf. 28, 24, California, 1,000. Um, so I'm, I'm not surprised that California, being a much bigger place, much denser population even, um, has more dispensaries. But that's a place that is, as far as saturation of dispensaries, pretty probably getting pretty close. Sir? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm sure it's not a liability that's factored in. Um, but uh, back to Wall Street, um, doesn't matter if it's stocks, cannabis, or Bitcoin, um, it gathers its value by its scarcity. So, you know, sadly, when, when there's a drought and it affects grapes in a negative way in one part of California, makes the rest of them worth more in the other part. So. I doubt that California is going to have a sweeping fire that crushes the entire state. And they're not even the biggest growing area uh, necessarily in the United States. But like I say, it's a very high end that they're growing there. Yes, ma'am. Are pesticides involved in part of the process? Yes, in some cases. Some of these uh, vertical dispensaries where they grow it, refine it, and uh, sell it through their dispensary will have an organic proof that they are fully organic and they're not pumping a bunch of pesticides into it. But there are others who, to especially the outdoor growers, um, use a fair amount of pesticides of one sort or another. Sir, standing up right there, sir. A uh, question regarding uh, your portfolio. You've shown a lot of different cannabis stocks. And mm -hmm. It looks like everything around the whole uh, chain. Yes, sir. My biggest holding right now is Canopy, CGC. Because uh, it's the big one. Because it's the big one. Um, and because it's got, um, I, can, I can hedge it more effectively than the others. When I started the presentation, I talked to you, to you guys about, you know, if I believe that this is going to keep going like this, but I do think that it's going to see things like this, those sawtooth or whatever kinds of rallies, um, this is the best and easiest to hedge. And believe it or not, Tilray is not bad either. Um, but right now, I don't own it. Tilray is a 45, though, right? Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah that, I mean, exactly, exactly, exactly. I mean, That's you know, yeah, that is. And some of those are going to happen because of uh, 
beyond market demand issues because, like I say, that's more or less more likely a uh, um, somebody got caught short. Sir, in the back. Yeah, as, as new states are bringing on legalizing, whether it's recreational or medical, are they starting to figure out how many licenses issue? Because it's really hard to get a Small, right. Um, I, I think that they are. So, but every state's going to take its time issuing it. Um, and sooner or later, uh, those licenses, especially the more dear ones, again, gather their value by their scarcity. Um, Florida, that's why I like a lot of those plays, because there's so few dispensaries, and they're really nailing it as far as how they um, deliver. But I think that uh, every state's just going to make their own rules until the federal government does ultimately get involved. Sir? With your interest inside your portfolio with all of the, all of the, um, the current holdings that you have, what's your interaction and at what level are you looking at with regards to legalization at the federal level? Do you have any interaction in that space? And if you do, what's your knowledge of it? Um, unfortunately, my knowledge is not tremendous in that part. Um, but. Uh, my brother and I, we, we were really angry because uh, two weeks ago, we have a cannabis ETF that is ready to launch. It's all, I mean, we've done all the paperwork. It's all ready to launch. And I mean, funded, ready to go, symbol THCX uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, it's ready to go. Innovation Shares um, is bringing it out for us. Um, and Pete and I are the advisors on the fund. It's going to be a 40 stock fund. Um, Every stock is 100 million minimum market cap, and we reset monthly, rebalancing the portfolio. Since they're all equally weighted, we rebalance every single month. Otherwise, when you get something like Kronos, when CRON jumped from, I think, 550 or something like that to 23 or something in that range, um, all of a sudden it becomes the tail that wags the dog. I mean, it's going to overshadow everything in the portfolio since they started equally weighted and so forth. But to answer the gentleman's question and why I don't have insight, all the lawyers and all the people we were talking to at the SEC and at, in the government said, you're good. We'll probably approve you on Friday. This is two weeks ago. And then they held us up. So we will, once they do approve it, we will be launched two days later because you have, we have to wait two days before we launch it. Um, but we're already approved. Like I say, we have the symbol reserved on the New York Stock Exchange. We're ready to go. But so my insight isn't better than anybody else's as far as the government, because I thought we'd be up right now for this show even. Sir? Couldn't the, uh, the football clubs avoid their problem by just not testing the cannabis in the states where it's legal? And they could do that. <laughs> um, and by the way, right now, the, only, the way it works in the NFL, because my brother played for six years, the way it works is they test you during training camp. And unless you have like an incident where you beat your wife, girlfriend, or whatever, um, or get in a car crash, or are drunk driving or something, they can't retest you until the next training camp. So technically, if you didn't get in trouble, they'd never know. They wouldn't be able to go after you. Um, so you guys, I'm going to have to stop now, but I'm going to be around throughout the day, and we'll talk with some of the uh, folks that are going to be presenting. But to not get far behind, I have to bring up uh, Greg Fox from uh, 